this morning we are interviewing Mr. Santiago Brito Craver at his residence, 7208 Alpine Street, El Paso, Texas. We would also like to take uh, a picture of his family. And this morning we have his wife, Mrs. Craver, and their daughter. If I may introduce Mrs. Craver, if you could just give us your full name. Uh, Francisca Sainz Craver. Okay, and you were born here in El Paso? Correct. Thank you. And if you could tell us a little bit about your parents and brothers and sisters? Well, my mother and my father were born in Jimenez, Mex Chihuahua, Mexico. And um, their name. Hmm? Their name. Francisca Melendez Sainz. And my father was Nepomuceno Juan Sainz. And then my daughters, uh, Elvia is the oldest one. She is assistant principal from Bui High School. Irma, next is Irma Craver Castillo. And she's a um, how do you call counselor. counselor from uh, the community college from Valle del Va Valle Verde. Valle Verde. And then I have my daughter, Laura Craver Delgado. And she lives in San Antonio. And um, her husband is an FBI. And uh, she's a teacher. She's teaching. And uh, also, she's. Um, the, she serves the uh, district of uh, the board of uh, schools in San Antonio. And then I have my granddaughter, which is of um, Irma Andrea Castillo. She's uh, 16 years old. She's going to high school now. And then I have Adrian, my grandson, Alvia's son, and he's 13 years old, and he's going to middle school. Okay, Ms. Craver, what, uh, you had been working at the Army base here during the war. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, well, we, I was, um, I was one of the dispatchers from the bundles of clean clothes going out, working at the uh, Fort Bliss uh, laundry. And um, then from there, they placed me at the office to be the, the one that would uh, be checking on all the work that would be done all day. and. Uh, and the hours of each worker there, and um, getting all everything in form for the payday. And you did this for how many years? For how long? Well, I started working there in 1943 till 46. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Craig. Thank you. And this morning we also have Mr. and Ms. Craver's daughter. If you could give us your name and also what it is that, that your profession. I'm Irma Craver Castillo and I'm a counselor at the El Paso Community College. And could you t give us a little background about your education? Well, um, I'm um, born and raised here in El Paso and I'm a graduate of Baylor High School. And from Bel Air, I uh, decided to go to the University of Texas at El Paso to pursue a bachelor's degree 
in social work and um, then from there I also worked part-time at the community college as a peer counselor uh, while I was going to UTEP and so um, I became interested in the counseling profession that way. Uh, so then after I graduated from UTEP, I decided to pursue my master's degree. So I have my Master um, of Science in Social Work from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, so um, I worked in the mental health area here in, in El Paso County for about 10 years and then uh, from there I, I uh, did get a counseling job at the community college in 1992. When did you graduate from uh, UT Austin? I graduated in 1985, and they had a pilot program uh, from UT Austin here in El Paso uh, at UTEP. So the professors from UT Austin would come over to um, El Paso, and I, I did that pilot program, and that's how I was able to get my master's degree uh, from UT Austin, but here in El Paso. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and uh, in continuing our interview of Mr. Santiago Benito Craver this morning, be November the 6th of 19, or 2003, excuse me, and this is uh, taking place at his residence at 7208 Alpine Street, El Paso, Texas, and the uh, zip code would be 7991. Five. Good morning, Mr. Benito, uh, Mr. Craver. This morning, I would like to start with uh, the first question. If you could tell us a little bit about your family and what your daily life was like, and if you could give us your parents' names first. My mother's name was Anna Brito. My father's name was John Craver. And uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had two sisters and one brother. Okay, could you give me their names, please? My older sister, Margarita Craver Reyes. My brother was Manuel Craver. And my youngest sister, Maria Alicia Batres. Okay, um, if you could tell us a little bit of what your dad did, what was his work, his profession? Well, he was a bridge builder, according to, you know, the, what my mother used to tell us. Okay, and uh, your mother, did she have some type of work or what, what did she used to do? Well, she used to be a chambermaid at a hotel and then she started doing house, domestic housework. Okay. <coughs> Okay, and you had mentioned, and I know that this must be difficult, but uh, with your dad, that your dad had left the family at, at uh, when did he leave your, your family? Must have been around 1925. He just did, took off and never came back. And so, did you, do you remember him? His no, not, 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 not. Not really, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Okay, and if you could tell us, what memories do you have of your mother? Well, my mother was hard working all the time to, you know, make enough money to uh, support her, her children. But she died in 1937, when I was about 16 and a half years old. Okay. And so, economically, it was a real struggle then, huh? Oh, yes, very much so. so. Only my grandmother took us in, you know, after my father left. And so the family lived with your grandmother? Yeah, after, after. And that was 
what your uh, grandfather or grandmother's side of the family? Yes. Okay. okay. My mother's side of the family. Right, yeah. right. Okay, okay. And do you remember her? My grandmother? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. She died in 1929. I was nine years old when she died. Okay. And did you stay living in the same house? Yes. Okay. In fact, my sister still lives there. Okay. Okay. okay could you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Well, uh, like I said, I went to San Ysidro School, the uh, grammar school. I used to live on over the street with my where my grandparents' uh, house is located. It was to be over the street. Now it's Ladrillo Street. So a little bit of difference there is to go swimming uh, uh, with the rest of the boys in, in the Franklin Canal. <laughs> and uh, what else? Uh, Played a little, you know, a little uh, baseball and with the rest of the kids and from my neighborhood. And I graduated from San Jacinto High uh, uh, Grammar School, then went on to Bowie, where I, I went two and a half years. And then I had to quit school to, you know, uh, help support my, my younger sister and brother. I, you, you know, odd jobs, uh, working here and there. Uh, went to the CC camps. Okay, and when you were a young, a youngster, did you have little jobs that you would do, or do you? Well, uh, when I was, I had a little old uh, red wagon car, you know, one of those little, little pool, you know, little red wagon, and my mother gave, gave me two daughters. I was about five, years, six years old, seven years old. Two dollars to go get groceries. So I went where I could find the cheapest uh, prices on, on on food. See, cause we, you, if we did with two dollars, you you could feed a whole family. At at that time, it was in about 1927, 28. Somewhere under there, yeah. And that's about it. And what language was mostly speaking spoken as you were coming up? Spanish. Spanish, Spanish all the time, you know, at home. It, when grandparents came from Mexico, so everybody spoke Spanish at the time. And when did you learn English or start learning English? When I went to, uh, I was about second grade in, in, in grammar school when I was about seven years old, six, seven years old. And that's when you started learning mm. English. Mm. Okay, in, in those years, uh, which radio stations would you have listened to? Well, we had KTSM here in El Paso, and I think it was KROD, you know, in, in Juarez, they had XJ. Mm -hmm. KROD? Yeah. Or was then KROD? Okay. Okay, and did you atter attend a church? Yeah. I went to Catholic uh, church. I, I was born, born and raised a Catholic. At what we, church did you attend? Saint Ignatius Church. Okay. 
Okay, when, uh, what was school like at, as you were coming up in, in elementary school? What was it like for you? Well, I used to like it a lot. You know, uh, teachers took their time to, you know, teach us uh, Latino kids to speak English and uh, all of that. They, they had a lot of patience with us, you know. So I guess they did pretty good. Okay, and at this time, did, was the school segregated or were you pretty much mixed? It was segregated. Only, only the, the colored people didn't go to... Everybody was went to the same school, you know. Okay, so the Anglos and the Mexicans, uh, Mexicans and the Arabs or whatever they were, Chinese, they went to the same school. Okay. But the, the colored people were, were they had the different schools. Okay. Okay, and how about the holidays or, or fiestas? Did you? attend those and were they something that you look forward to? Well, I was looking for the Cinco de Mayo on the, the, the 6th of September. Okay. 6th of September. Could you tell us a little bit about that as to what you did or? Well, it used to be, uh, they used to have uh, some going at, at the Mexican Council here in El Paso. And so we went over there and uh, listened to music or uh, speeches or whatever that you know, that was going on. Okay. Okay, if we could now go to the CCC. CCC. And could you tell us about that experience? Well, when I quit high school, because I had to go to work, you know, go get to, so there was a CC camps by the, it was just, uh, by the, by the government for underprivileged kids, you know, so went to work for them for, for a year. I spent six months in the Lincoln National Forest, fighting forest fires and cutting down, uh, Infested trees with a weevil, weevil, with weevil, and burning the bark, and same thing over in the other forest uh, as the, the Gila National Forest. It, the, the name of the, the camp was the Willow Creek CC uh, Camp, Civilian Conservation Camp. And so, the first camp then was what the Lincoln Forest National Forest. Lincoln National Forest, located in Mayhill, New Mexico. Okay. And then uh, uh, the next at the Gila Forest, and that was close to. It was Willow Creek. Okay. Close to Silver City. Okay. And what year did you do this? When when did you start? Uh, well, 1937 to 38, you know, middle, 37 to middle 38. Okay, and then uh, you came back to El Paso. Came back to El Paso. And what were you doing then as far as employment? Well, I got a, a job at the uh, Mayfield Lumber Company and loading freight car, cars full of... Uh, uh, cement and lumber and this and that. And then I went to work for... I went to California and worked for the railroad and came back to El Paso. And I uh, started working at uh, William Bowman General Hospital, which is a government hospital for the Army, you know, Army, Army Hospital. Okay, let me regress to 
when you were in, in uh, California. What uh, railroad line did you work on? Oh, I worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad. Okay. You know, lane track and do whatever. And you were there for how long? Uh, uh, about six months. Okay. And then while well, you were at, working at William Beaumont, what uh, type of work did you do there? Well, I was, worked as a ward boy, you know, uh, what do you call those? Uh, do everything, you know, clean up and uh, work in the wards, to bring the food to the, to the patients and... As an orderly? Yeah, orderly, an orderly. And you worked there how long? About a, almost a year, I think. Okay. And can you remember what you were doing when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Exactly, I can tell you that. I was coming out of the theater, you know, when we heard the, the the newspaper extras going around, you know, the, you know, the Japs of uh, Tech Her Pearl Harbor. And then, and then uh, after that, uh, when I turned, I think, 18, I had to go arrest you for the draft, and I got drafted. I worked some more, uh, after, after, uh, Working the railroad, I went to came back to El Paso work for the for the William Bowman Hospital. It's an army hospital, and I stayed there for till before the I went into the army. They called me into the army, uh, but a couple of months months before. Uh, so, how old were you when you were inducted? Twenty-one and something, twenty. Okay. Let's see, twenty-two. Okay. And so, you were inducted here at uh, at Fort Bliss. At Fort Bliss, yes. Okay. And where did you uh, take basic training? Camp Berkeley, Texas, which is near Abilene. And you were there for how long? Oh, about six six months and. Somewhere around there, and then they sent us to Camp Groover, Oklahoma, which is near Muskogee. Stay so for another more training, about six more months. And what were you uh, training on, or what did you? Do you know, just being a, a, a medic. Uh, uh, You know, learning how to how to take care of the wounded or sick or wounded, and then and, and taking how to give shots to the, to the patients, and uh, which I did when 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 we went over there to to Africa, when we went to Africa, that's what I was doing. And then uh, I started driving trucks, driving ambulance, driving trucks, and, or pulling guard duty, or you know, so, so, what, taking care of the, the, the patients. Okay, so then from Abilene, what base did you go to next then? Evelyn to From Fort Barkley World. Barkley, we went to Camp Groover, Oklahoma. Okay. Took more training. Right. Okay. Medical. And and from there, from Camp Groover. Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And what did you do there? Just waited to to the orders to go overseas. Okay. Then, from there, from Camp Kilmer, I went to Staten Island and took a liberty. Uh, troop for, uh, to transport. Do you remember the name of the ship? Yes. Dorothy M. M. Dix. Dorothy M. Dix. Okay. 
And how long were you on board ship? About eight or nine days. And what was that experience like? Oh, it was, <laughs> it was uh, kind of not too very good because uh, I was seasick most of the time. What what time of the year did you cross? Uh, I think it was March. So pretty much in the winter time. Huh? Yeah. I went aboard with a, with a temperature of 140 degrees because I had, I had a cold, you know, when I was. It was too cold in the New Jersey for us. So uh, I caught a cold and I I landed in the, in the, in the hospital in, in the, in aboard, aboard the, the Dorothy L. Dix. And I stayed there for about a week till I got okay. But I was seasick most of the time. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? What was it like? Well, we were cramped in like a bunch of sardines. And uh, if you wanted to, you know, to vomit, <laughs> you had to run or, or you vomited in your helmet. <laughs> and if you couldn't make it to, to the deck to, you know, to vomit overboard. You did it in your helmet, because the, the restrooms were always full. <laughs> okay, and can you remember about the mess there in in onboard ship? What was the the kitchen or the? Well, uh, it was pretty good because they put the, all the people to, you know the. the the soldiers that were being transported, they put them to clean decks or clean the toilets and this and that. Yeah, well, did, and go or pull, pull KP duty. But they spared me because I, I just got out of the hospital. Okay, and so where did you land? We went through. From Southern Island, we went, you know, on the, on the Atlantic Ocean. To we landed, we went through the Straits of Gibraltar, and we landed in Oran, Algeria. Oran. And could you tell us a little bit about that town or point? Well, didn't see much of the town. We the, the, we we had a uh, we camped out out in the Este because they were bombing the, the the port right there in Oran. And they used to come over and bomb it. And who was that? The Germans. Okay. So we were camped out out in the the hills. You know, pitching pop tents and. Eating K rations. Were you ever attacked while you were there at that camp? Well, we had we had a scare, you know, but we, we I didn't see any because we were kind of kind of about a mile away from the port mm -hmm. where they used to attack most of the time. And what was the terrain like there? The terrain was kind of hilly with. You know, like just uh, like uh, those mountains over here, but it was a little more uh, greenery, I think. And he drank more. He drank a little bit more than here with the Franklin Mountains. Yeah, uh -huh. Texas. right. Okay, okay. And how long were you there? Oh, we stayed about two, three weeks, somewhere in there. Just, you know, just waiting for our orders or... And from there, where did you go? We went to a little village outside of uh, Constantine, Algeria. Constantine is the name of the town. 
It was, we used to serve as the, the they used to be in the airport there, uh, an army port, airport. We used to service it. We, we take care of their sick and wound, uh, wounded, you know, because they'd, they'd go bomb and they'd come back. Some, some of them were injured uh, and some of them were sick or whatever. And uh, we took, they took them to the hospital and took care of them. Some of them got killed. And your job at the time, so then would you have gone up to the airplanes and taken the, the people off, or were you at an infirmary? Right now, uh, right there, uh, I was pulling guard duty. Okay. okay. Yeah, you, you know, around the perimeter, you don't take... Right. And how long were you there? Oh, about three or four months. And from there, where did you go? From there, we moved up to B30. You know, B30 is, is, is over there in Tunisia now. Okay. And how long were you there? We were there about five or six months, and, and did the same thing, and uh, now I, I was a truck driver, I'm an ambulance driver, truck driver, or jeep driver, whatever you want to call it, but I was a driver. And did, at that point, um, how close or far away were the Germans or Italians or? Well, when we were still uh, moving up to to Biserti, they were still fighting the, the, the Catherine Pass, or the, the Catherine Pass. So they, after that, when we got to Biserti, the war had already, you know, the, the Germans had already surrendered in in Tunisia. That's where they surrendered. And, and then after we moved to Tunis, after Biserti, we moved to Tunis. And you were in Tunis for how long? About a year. Okay. And what type of work were you doing there? Driving ambulance and whatever, two and a half ton trucks or weapons carriers or whatever they used to. Well, we had to, uh, four types of vehicles. We had the ambulance. We had two and a half ton trucks to get supplies. We had weapons carriers to go get su supplies too, and the jeeps. So, in this time, did you did you see a lot of injured men, a lot of wounded men? Well, yes. Uh, in fact, when when I was, we were in uh, when they were fighting in, in, in the Catherine Pass and to you know through to Sahara Desert from from Libya and they, 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 uh, one of my friends that used to work for, for me at Beaumont, he came back wounded because they put me in the medical corps, they put him in, in, in tanks, so he, his tank got hit by a you know, shell. And he had to get out to the bottom because they got a scape hatch in the bottom. And the, thre the threads ran over his fingers and cut him off. <laughs> so you, you, saw him, <coughs> you saw him there? I saw him in my hospital, the hospital I was in. It was a station hospital, it, the uh, 57 station hospital. And I took care of his wounds, you know, but when I, was, I wasn't driving. And have you seen him back here in the I saw him here in El Paso, yeah, lots of times. Wonderful. See, we used to be buddies, we used to work together at Beaumont. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And did you also see a lot of dead men? 
in while you were driving a- the ambulances, or did you? Well, uh, I saw what uh, the ones that died at the, at the hospital. Uh, you know, when, from wounds or sickness or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, I was, I, I, I didn't. I didn't bury them, you know. I, I they had a special graves registration that did the burying. And so they were buried there. Uh, sometimes near there, and then uh, not in the hospital, but right, you right. know, right where, where they, had, they, they had the cemetery. Yes. Right, right. Okay. And so you were there for how long? For a year? For a year in Tunis, yeah, but. Nine months or a year, somewhere in there. Still driving. Right. And from there? From there, they sent us to Casablanca, Morocco. Not not, a, not the whole uh, personnel at the hospital, just about five or six of us. And some they sent to, to Italy, some, some they sent to some other places besides, because uh, uh, the fighting had already left, you know, Tunis, they went to Sicily and none of the places over there. Right. And so in Casablanca, I was doing the same thing, driving. And how long were you there? But five or six months, somewhere about, about till the end of the 45. Or, what division were you with? It was the Medical Corps. Okay. The Medical Corps. And so then you would have been what? Uh, non combatant. Okay, okay. It, well, you were, uh, you know, take, like I said, to the hospital right. work, uh, taking care of wounded, sick, wounded. What would be some memories that you would like to share with us from that time? Memories, I've got a lot of memories, but uh, you know, uh, like uh, made a lot of friends. And uh, like I said, I met Leo, my, my buddy that uh, got wounded. Then I met another one that used to live in my neighborhood when we were kids. Met him in Africa too, and he he went he was with the 36th Division. And he went on to a, to Italy, and he got taken prisoner over there till the end of the war. Then we all came back to El Paso. We 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 went we went again. And what do you remember of the the people that were living there in those parts of Africa? Those parts of Africa, it, every, North Africa was a French protectorate, and the Arabs were under them, but it was it was right, rightfully their country. So the French were just like the Spanish when they came to Mexico. You see what I mean? Yeah. And uh, they had um, on they, they, they just waiting for a chance to kick the French out, like Mexico did. Mm-hmm. And so they did. After the, after the war, they did all that. And what can you remember about the Arabs? The Arabs, they got a different culture than, than anybody else's. They used to come over, where, where, you know, uh, people like, uh, some of them were thieves. And uh, not all of them were, you know, not all, not all of them, but uh, most of them were, you know, we had to be keep an eye on them all the time, get, take, get them away from from supplies and all that. 
But some of them were pretty good, were pretty nice people, were hard working. We had some Arabs that used to drive for, you know, that was, that was running uh, the the pool uh, where we used to keep the, the, the trucks. I, I was the dispatching the yeah, motor pool, yeah. And uh, we had some Arab drivers. And did you go into their like restaurants or? We went to the Kasbah, you know, or the, the Kasbah was uh, where, you know, the Arabs living in there and the other people out. We used to have Spanish friends over there. We used to go uh, visit in the Kasbah, in the, in the, it, it, it's uh, like a, a city within a city. Like the, you, you, did you see the, the, the show? What is this? Algiers with uh, the Medina, the Casva, they call it different different names. Uh, you know what, you know what I mean, right? All the heirs live in there. It was, our limits to, to us. <laughs> it was our, our, our limits to us. We couldn't go in there. We, we, and how about the French? Were were there a lot of French living in those areas? Well, yeah, yeah. there were a lot of French people. They ran most of the countries. Uh, it was just Algeria, Tunisia, and, and uh, Morocco. But it was run by the, by the French. Like. They did in Mexico when they came in. They didn't know the Spanish came in. Okay, so then were there restaurants that you would go to or bars? Mostly we went to bars, not not restaurants. Uh, very few restaurants that had enough food to, to, to sell, you know, you know. Because it was during the, the, the war and supplies was scarce. And at the bars, what uh, what type of, of liquor did they have, or what? Oh, they had this flat beer. It was they had uh, triple sack. They called it triple sack. Uh, they had they had brandy. They had wine. They pretty good wine. <laughs> was that in short supply also, or not? Well, not 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 the liquor, no. I, I don't know how they did it, but they had some. They made the wine right there in that, in oh. Africa. They, they had their own, but there was some some type of uh, of cognac that was pretty hard to get. So uh, anybody that knew anybody. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the only one that could get it. I don't remember what the name of it was. It was pretty good cognac. And then we, we got we, we, we got to work, we could get some American beer. Right? And how did the French treat the Americans? Well, like it was pretty good, but except that, you know, like they did in England, they they got sort of uh, against the Americans, uh, mad at the Americans taking off their, their taking the, their girlfriends or their their women. And so that happened too. Huh? Oh, there's a lot of, lot of beautiful girls in in in, in North Africa. French girls, uh, Italian girls, Spanish girls, Arab girls, uh, all kinds of girls. And did you ever have problems with the French? Well, this one time we, we went to a, to this place and this Frenchman, he, he, saw, uh, he was a lieutenant, he wouldn't let us in. So. We started, you know, one of my bodies, not me, started fighting with him, so they put us all in jail. In the Pugusgao. <laughs> 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 
And how about the Arabs? How did what were they like uh, as far as the relationship with the Americans? They were pretty good, pretty good. Except that, like I said, there you had to be watching them because they would take things that didn't belong to them. <laughs> But it must have been pretty difficult for them also, uh, financially. Or well, financially, yes. Uh, they used to watch uh, the G.I.S. clothes. And uh, the women did, but, uh, you know, the, the men went and collected the money and kept it for himself, so. And uh, they, Kind of people that uh, they didn't, they don't think very much about their women. If they, if they had a boy, well, they they love him to death. But the the girl, they send her out to prostitute or whatever, <laughs> you know. They, they not the women. They 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 didn't care very much about their women. Because was saying that uh, before the war, you know, the, the man would walk in front because the woman, the woman has to follow him, and she, 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 be carrying a load of wood or something, and the guy just walking down with his cane. <laughs> and and during the war, they sent her in front because they were landmines. <laughs> <laughs> And let me ask you, at the time that you were in the military, did you see discrimination within the U.S. Army itself? I didn't see any. No. No discrimination. <coughs> Except that the, the colored soldiers were apart. There were no, they were, they were segregated. And so then you spent how long in, in North Africa? 30, 33 months. 33 months. Did you learn a little French? I learned a little bit of French, yeah. A little bit of Italian. And so at, at this time, uh, were you involved in any dangerous situations with uh, the Germans or Italians? <coughs> the Germans, they had them, they, they had them prisoners, but we had, we had Italian uh, soldiers that has been captured in Africa working for us, pulling the all the KP duties and, the, and this and that and pitching tents or whatever. And were they POWs? POWs, they yes. Okay. Yeah, but we, we treated them pretty good. Sometimes they ate better than we did. The Italians, though. The Germans, I don't know about them. I, we didn't have any... any. Uh, they used to send the, the, the Germans over here to the United States. <laughs> Okay, so then when you were in was it Casablanca? Casablanca. And from there you came came back to the United States? Right. And can you remember the name of the ship that you were on when you returned? USS Cristobal. And we boarded in Casablanca and came and landed in Newport News, Virginia. And from there took train on our way to Fort Sam Houston, where we got my discharge. Fort Sam Houston. And that was what is the date on that? Oh it was but 
uh, December the let's say about uh, it's there in my seventh. Yeah, seventh was uh, ninth or seventh or something. Uh, of nineteen nineteen forty five. Okay. Is there something else that you could tell us, or that you would care to tell us about your time in the military? Well, I seem to enjoy it. Good. I wasn't any danger just going across uh, submarines, you know, the, uh, on account of submarines, because they used to go around in packs, wolf packs, they call them. But after that, I kind of enjoyed my, my place, my, my time over there in Africa. You see, different kinds of people, different cultures, different everything. And let me ask you, what was the climate like there in, in North Africa? In the winter it gets cold, but uh, it's, in the summer it gets hot. We were near the Sahara Desert. Sometimes it got to over 100, 120, 100. And then, it was, but in the winter it got cold and heck was I was guarding the guarding the the for the kept prisoners, uh, American prisoners, uh, the uh, the brig, the brig, yeah. In in in, in the army it was. Uh, I forgot what they called it. Were they the stockade? Stockade, yeah. And uh, boy, it was cold and hell at night. Oof. It never was so cold in, <laughs> before. And that one night, I can still remember it. It kept hollering and hollering for the couple of the guards. You know, the guards come relieve me, get, get, get some coffee. Nobody came. Everybody was inside the the buildings or whatever. <laughs> mm. So it get very cold. Yeah, it's four on. F we used to put pull four on, four on, uh, four off, uh, eight off. I think it was four on, four off on duty. Right. Four hours on and eight hours. Eight, eight, eight hours off. off. Right. And so then you were discharged at uh, Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam Houston, yes. Right. And you came back, what, on the train or bus? Or train. On the train. Okay, and, and returning to El Paso. What was that like? What could you tell us about, about that, about upon your return? How did you feel? Well, I felt pretty good, yeah. Because I, I was out of the Army and you had to get up at five, 5 in the morning or whatever, you, you know, the Army rules are. No rules. Uh, go out at night and have beer so you don't have to ask for a pass. Or, and, uh, Yeah, soon after that, I, I started working for the truck lines, 46. In, I think, it, yeah, yeah, I started in 40, 46. From, uh, I laid off of work for for a while, because I was getting, we were getting that severance pay and, uh, and 50, 20, 50, what was it, 20, 20, 52, 20, 52, 20 dollars a week from the government. Doing a little bit of odd jobs. And uh, till I started working for the trucking company. Okay, and you said 20, 52, that would have been 20 dollars for what, for 52 Fif weeks? Yeah, but I didn't take all I mean. mm -hmm. like, I quit before that. 
twenty dollars a week okay. when I got got a job. And okay, so then you started being a truck driver. Right, I started working in the, the freight industry. And what kind of money were you making then? In the freight industry, yes, right. I started making uh, eighty-two cents an hour, and almost every every so often, you know, I was Jimmy Hoffa would get some money from the race a little. For when I uh, when I retired, I was making twelve dollars and. Fifty cents an hour, but eighty-two to twelve dollars and fifty cents an hour is. So you were a member of the union. You may remember that union, yes, Teamsters Union. Okay. Let me let me get back to the military and and ask you, what was your salary when you first started, and then at the end, how much were you making? Fifty dollars a week. Okay. <laughs> I mean a month. A month. Okay. And when you started, how much did you start making? Fifty dollars a month. And when you ended three three years later? Fifty dollars a month. That was fifty dollars <laughs> all the way through. Okay. okay. Okay, so then you come back and you're a truck driver. Yes. And where were you hauling? I was working around town for you know, for uh for when I started with uh, Texas, Arizona, was working around town. When I got to Santa Fe, when I transferred to Santa Fe, I used to work around town and go out to on, on road trips. Went to Albuquerque and then went to Silver City, and you know, I used to take extra extra runs, what they call it. And how many hours a week would you work? Well, it, from here to Albuquerque, it's like you started. It started out at twelve o'clock. Got to Albuquerque, dropping freight uh, along the way, and got to Albuquerque about eight or nine in the morning. Went to sleep, and came back at night, doing the same thing, dropping freight from over there to El Paso and bring whatever freight we had left to for El Paso. So we used to drop at Belen, Socorro, uh, uh, TRC, Hatch, and going up, doing the same thing. And so you never really traveled outside of New Mexico and Texas? Mm, driving, uh, right. driving. Okay. Okay. Never went east, just west, you know, right. and north. Mm -hmm. And was it a pretty tiring job? Lonesome, at night, you know, on the road. When you're on the road, it gets kind of lonesome because you driving by yourself. He was always finding little notes that my daughter would, would place in his uh, truck, blessing him and just keep on singing on his way. <laughs> singing smoke, that's what I used to do before, when I wasn't working at unloading freight, you know. Okay, uh, let me stop here and let me get another uh, little tape here. And so we'll stop and then we'll continue in a couple of minutes. <laughs> yes, uh, we are in the second tape of Mr. Santiago Brito Craver. Uh, and we will continue. Mr. Craver. But what? You had said that you'd forgotten to tell me. Oh, when we went to through the going over to Africa, well, we went through the Strait of Gibraltar. In the Mediterranean, you go from the from the Atlantic to through the Straits into the Mediterranean. Say you were there. Right. 
and we got caught by the submarines. But we had protection around us, so dropping death charges and all of that. So nothing happened. We got to our destination and debarked. And okay, and, and let me ask you, um, in the military, did you have other Mexican-American friends there with you? Oh, yes. There was about, about eight or nine of us Mexican-Americans in, in, in my outfit, in my, where, I, where I was stationed. So then throughout this time, you also continue to speak Spanish? Oh, yes, all the time. Okay. As you returned, and as we've already covered your work history, did you encounter any problems with discrimination here in El Paso? After the war, no, not not really. No, everything's the same as it is today. And did you see El Paso any differently? Was it any different from before when you first went into the military, and in comparison to after you you uh, were discharged? Did you see any differences in El Paso itself? Well, you we started growing. And it's still growing. After you know, after we came back from the army, the the town, uh, the city seemed uh, a little bigger to me. You know, it, it was growing all the time. Before the the, the, the Anglos used to live in the north side, and the Mexicans on the south side, like all the all the other Mexican towns. That like San Antonio and right. All right. Okay, did you belong to any organizations or clubs? None whatsoever. Okay. Okay, and when did you marry? Nineteen forty eight. And could you give us your wife's name? Francisca Science Graver. Okay. And where did you meet her? Oh, that was before the, before the war. We met at a, they say September, you know, the word uh, Mexican consulate, which is downtown. You just just go there to listen to music or speeches or whatever. Mostly, mostly music. Okay, and could you name your three daughters for us? There's Elvia, which is the oldest, then Irma, next to Elvia's, and Laura, the youngest one. Okay, and in your opinion, was their situation better than yours? Lots better. Very, because uh, they had the support I didn't have, you know, to go to school. They had my support. And their mother, and now I had a good job, and I we send them off to school. All, uh, you know, uh, get as much as edu education as, as we could give them. And let me ask. Um, as far as changes for the Mexican American, what changes have you seen from the time that you were growing up to today? 
Well, I see more Mexican American uh, kids going to college, which didn't happen before, you know. There were very few Mexican Americans that could afford going to college because it, it was during the Depression. The Mexican Americans that went to college were, were the ones that had fathers with with their own uh, businesses or whatever, and uh, and they, or they had good jobs. Now nowadays the kids they're better off than what we were, lots better off than what we were when I was growing up. And what problems might you still see with? The Latinos. The Latinos. Uh, if I was to give some advice, is to all the young kids to stay in school and get as much education as they can get. That's what does it all. Would you encourage the young people to go into the military? Not necessarily. When they, uh, if they want to volunteer, that's their business, fair enough. But uh, I wouldn't encourage them to go into the military. No. Not that I've got anything against the military, because I, I went to the military and had a good time. I mean, not, not such a bad time of it. I got to to see different people, different country. But I won't volunteer. <laughs> and what can you tell us? Um, Okay, your three daughters, uh, could you tell us about their education? Well, I believe that they've got, they've done pretty well for, for themselves. All of them have pretty good jobs with, uh, you know, teaching or uh, with a school, uh, districts or whatever and and they live better than what we did before you know they make more money and, and they better homes and cars which I never had a car till I started working for for Santa Fe never even had a bicycle you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Okay, could you tell us a little bit about your nephews, nieces? Uh, my nephews uh, from my, my younger sister's uh, marriage, they done pretty good. And who is that? There's Al Batres, the Batres, Santiago Batres, Mauricio Batres, Margie Batres, but they're all married and they got their own, they got pretty good jobs. Like Al, he's a well educated boy, he's, a, he's got a, a doctor in uh, cream in uh, clinical psychology. And Santiago is a, a dentist. Mauricio is a principal in high school, in his school. And Margie, because she's married and, and she's got her own kids, you know, and different. But they've done pretty good. And they are the sons of which of your sisters? 
my younger sister Alicia, Maria Alicia Batres. And my other sister, she's been pretty, you know, she's got two daughters and three, three or four uh, sons. Now they're all working for the, they got pretty good jobs, so no problem there. Is there, is there anything that you'd like to add to what we've discussed this morning? But what, uh, military or? Uh, anything that you can think of that you may have think that we could add? Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your sister is doing all of this. Uh, you know, you know, uh, and, and I'd like to get her phone number so I can personally call her or whatever and then let her know that I appreciate what she's done. Hmm? Okay, Mr. Craver, it's been a pleasure meeting you and interviewing you. And uh, I personally, Robert Levis, would like to thank you, sir. And I thank you very much myself. You mean for me and my family, because they, they, they could have been here all the time. I mean, uh, today, if they, one, 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 only one of them is sick, and the other one lives over there in San Antonio. So. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you.